welcome everyone to another episode of the Brownfield Brain Trust. I think we're at about 15 episodes by now, and we've got a very interesting topic today. We're going to get a little geeky, a little engineering. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, vapor barriers or vapor intrusion mitigation systems, and there's all sorts of different terms uh, that you call them. I'm here with Justin Conaway of Terra Petra. Uh, industry expert throughout California in uh, vapor barriers. And as we've seen these more stringent regulatory criteria throughout the state, vapor barriers are having a profound and positive impact on our abil ability to uh, add infrastructure in California, including uh, much needed affordable housing. So Justin Conaway, uh, please tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Matt. I uh, appreciate the invite. Um, yeah, my name's Justin. I'm the Vice President and General Manager of Terra Petra. Terra Petra is a full-scope environmental engineering firm. Uh, we're also a full-scope waterproofing consulting firm. And so we handle all kinds of different projects from testing to design to inspection. And we really specialize in designing you know, methane and vapor intrusion mitigation systems, um, not only in California, but nationwide. Oh, I didn't know you went that far. Um, and do you call them VIMS for short, or is that in an appropriate term? No, we do. We call them okay. VIMS. Some people, some people call them, uh, forget what they call them, but they drop one of the letters. I forget which one, but I still refer to it as VIMS. Okay. Well, then that's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And then uh, how, how big is Terra Petra? Is most of your business in California? Or? Yeah, I would say, you know, 70, 80 percent of our business is in California. Um, and there are uh, about 15 of us that are on staff. Um, we have uh, another 15 inspectors um, that are out in the field inspecting the systems for us. And then we um, have partnerships with some other um, smaller cons consulting firms to kind of offset some of our services. All right, continuing. So what what kind of staff do you have in that 20 or so folks? Is it engineers? Is it installers? Uh, you know, um, the staffing is uh, engineers. We mm -hmm. have um, environmental scientists. Um, we have project managers. We have a large um, drafting team, CAD drafting team and uh, inspection supervisors. And then on the waterproofing side, we have uh, waterproofing consultants. I see. Uh, a for I see. forensic consultant who will come out and inspect, you know, buildings that are leaking, have water intrusion issues, stuff like that. Interesting. So I'm on the investor side and let's say I'm thinking of buying a site and there's some methyl, ethyl death in the ground. And I will, I know I'm going to remediate but I want to ensure that the agencies will accept a vapor barrier as part of the mitigation. Can you? Can I hire you guys to put together a design just to present to the water board or the DTSC or the health agency some preliminary uh, preliminary approaches? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, what I've been doing a lot more recently, like the beginning of this year, is writing kind of a basis of design or mm -hmm. vapor intrusion mitigation system. So um, I'll have a client come to me, whether it's the developer or the architect, and they'll present me with kind of some draft documents on their phase two environmental site assessment. Mm -hmm. Or maybe even it's just a phase one, and they said, we're anticipating the need for a vapor intrusion mitigation. Can you look at this and put together um, a basis of design on how you would mitigate this? And... Uh, um, yeah, I've been doing that pretty routinely this year. Uh, before this year, I didn't really do that very often. I think that's come about because of the vapor intrusion um, guidance, uh, suppl the supplemental vapor intrusions guidance that uh, Cal EPA and DTSC and the water board have come out. So, and that's actually why I asked the question. So it, it makes sense that you're seeing so much of that. Um, how long has uh, Terra Petra been around? Uh, we were founded in 2002. Oh, so um, you just get your 20-year mark. Congratulations. You did. Yeah. Actually, you're old enough to drink now. That's fantastic. <laughs> Terra Petra is. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So these VIM system, what kind of chemicals do they protect against? Uh, they typically what we see is PCE, TCE, um, some other VOCs, maybe benzene, uh, definitely methane, mm -hmm. um, and radon. Is there much of a use for radon in California? Or is that more in the mining states? It's it is mining states, so we see it elsewhere, uh, Colorado. We see a lot of it, um, mm. but it does pop up occasionally in California. I'm curious, and maybe I'm getting too much in the weeds. Where have you seen it in California? I'm not a geologist. We're kind of working. you know, it's it's a requirement of the housing agency. There's some sort of housing agency that has a radon either mitigation or testing requirement. So if uh, affordable housing is being built and they're using uh, specific funding from a certain agency, I they may require it. Yeah, but um, actual radon mitigation, we just, there are small little pocket areas that may be in a, in a radon zone um, that need mitigation. Very interesting. Well, let's get into some more nitty gritty. Justin's been kind mm -hmm. enough to send me uh, some membrane systems uh, photos, and let's see how technically savvy I am so I can get these on the screen. Justin, please uh, tell us about the three basic types of vapor intrusion mitigation systems that your team designs and installs. Yeah, well, um, what it is, is there are, like like you were saying, three basic types of membrane systems that are part of the of an effective vapor mitigation or methane mitigation system. Uh, first, I would say spray applied membranes uh, would be the first category. And um, these include liquid boots, EPRO, uh, vapor lock M, um, some of the systems um, that we're typically specifying. And what they consist of is some sort of carrier fabric is laid out over the subgrade. Mm -hmm. And then the membrane is a rubberized asphaltic uh, membrane that gets sprayed out. And you can see the spray wand on the image on the right is they build that up to the specified thickness. Typically, these membranes cure uh, about 40% of the uh, membrane uh, it shrinks down in capacity by about 40%. So if you spray it on at 100 mils, it'll shrink down to about a 60 mil thick membrane. I see. And so it I makes it, it makes a composite. And the benefits of the spray applied membrane is that it can be easily sealed to uh, footings and other penetrations through the membrane. Do you ever use this in conjunction with other membranes? Or just... Uh, sometimes we do. Sometimes there's a call for... Um, like a water vapor membrane, like mm -hmm. a 10 or 15 mil vapor membrane to protect uh, sensitive floor coverings inside a, a building. And so our membrane will go down and then there'll probably be some sort of permeable uh, aggregate layer or sand layer that goes over the top of it, you know, maybe four inches thick. And then um, the architect or the geotechnical engineer will call out for the use of like a 10 or 15 mil uh, plastic sheeting to go over the top of that. I see. And I see these rebars going vertically um, on the left drawing. How do you yeah. ensure that the penetration of the rebar doesn't impact the uh, usefulness of the vapor barrier? There is uh, a couple things that are done. There's a visual inspection. Uh, uh -huh. Typically, our projects will have a third party inspector. Oh, really? Either that's Either that's somebody from our office that's out there inspecting it on behalf of the engineer, or it's an independent inspector. So they'll do a visual inspection. Um, the installers are typically completing a smoke test where they inject smoke underneath the membrane mm -hmm. uh, and it applies pressure. And then if you see smoke coming out of, you know, like a rebar penetration, it's indicative of an incomplete seal. And uh, with a spray applied membrane, the applicator can come over and just uh, spray on the membrane um, and essentially seal up the smoke and the inspector can verify it. And uh, and that's typically what's done on, on these systems. Seems effective to me. So what other systems do you have? 
So the next one would be uh, what we call sheet goods systems. Um, so the sheet goods are your high density polyethylene or HDPE. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the image on the left. Uh, that's probably like a 60 mil thick HDPE going in. Um, another one would be like Stego wrap or Drago wrap, um, something like that. On the right side, you see there is Stego wrap installed there. That's uh, 10, 15, 20 mil thick membrane. The difference between these two, uh, as well as some other sheet good membranes, uh, the difference between these and a spray applied is that these come in rolls. Um, they they have their widths, you know, four, eight, 20 foot widths, and then they can be as long as 150 feet long. Mm -hmm. um, they're laid out and the seams are sealed in the field. Um, so on the left hand side, can't really see it. The guy um, kneeling down is is welding the plastic together and then on the right hand side all of the red that you see is actually a tape uh, manufacturer tape that's used to seal the overlaps of the membrane hmm. and then why would i want spray applied versus sheet good i, I didn't quite understand when when one is preferred over the other uh, sheet good, typically we're specifying these systems in large open areas. Mm. You know, if you, if you have a, like a warehouse or distribution facility of several hundred thousand square feet, and there's very few footings or other penetrations, um, these can be ideal. You sheet know, good is ideal. Yeah. Sheet good can be ideal in that case. Uh, spray applied membranes we see the most benefit when there's a lot of penetrations, um, structural detailing uh, that's needed, um, you know, uh, sub slab piping that's coming up that needs to be sealed to, uh, or smaller footprints, uh, the spray applied can be uh, going a lot more cost effectively. So these sheet goods are, as I visualize, vim system typically i didn't realize there were so many variations on these themes and do you test this similarly as you would with uh, the spray applied um these can be tested with a smoke test so yes they um a lot of specifications call for the smoke test as a default but with an hdpe welded seam membrane there is a different testing process because um you're trusting that the the field of the membrane uh, is has been manufactured properly and it's appropriate. And typically these things are inspected prior to being installed. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you're testing is the integrity of that seam. Yes. Um, and so uh, there's different tests that you can do. There's something called a spark test where they actually weld in a copper wire mm -hmm. into the extrusion weld. Mm -hmm. And then they run, they run like a, a sparking um, device across the top of it. So whenever they get an arc or they see a spark, it means there's an incomplete seal and they can come back in and, and patch it. Uh, they also have like a vacuum box test that they do. And a lot of times um, what, we, uh, what, we're, what we're specifying is that they're also doing uh, testing of the seam strength uh, for pull testing on it, where they cut a sample and uh, and actually pull it and make sure it meets the specs and then sending the additional samples to a lab to have it uh, laboratory tested for the uh, for the pull test. Seems like great QA, QC. Uh, and there's a yes. third type. Uh, yes, there is. So um, when we come across existing buildings mm -hmm. uh, where, where there's some sort of environmental personality you know going on and there's did, a potential. did you call it a personality i will use that. <laughs> I, I, I thought of environmental impairment environmental challenge but never personality all right uh, yeah it, it. it has an environmental personality and um <laughs> you know it's it's not feasible to put in uh an under slab system uh, a lot of times the slab is in place uh the building is going to go undergo very few renovations, if any. And so there's a, a post applied product um, out on the market, um, which is an epoxy coating that goes over the top of an existing slab. I would think these would be less effective than the other two, but am I wrong? 
Um, you know, these systems can be combined with subsub depressurization systems, and, oh, and I, I can get I into you know I can get into that more. But in in some cases, there's limited ability um, to mitigate, and so these systems have proven to be effective. You know, um, one of the most common names out there is probably Retrocoat. I think they were kind of the first on the scene with this technology. And uh, we've specified it and uh, witnessed installation on a few projects and had a lot of success with it. Interesting. So since you brought it up, could you tell us a bit about subslab depressurization systems? And do you do those or is it typically the environmental consultant that does those? So uh, Terra Petra is typically designing when we design a vapor intrusion mitigation system or a methane mitigation system, the primary um, mitigation component is actually subslab venting system. Okay. And oh. and that is combined with the the soil vapor barrier a lot of I times. See. And nice. and the subslab mitigation system consists of a, a matrix of collection pipes, whether they're round or flat. Um, they're placed within some sort of permeable aggregate layer. Typically, it's four inch thick, either sand or gravel. Um, and then it's connected to a series of vertical risers that run up through a building to the roof. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're designed to relieve soil gas pressure um, and provide a, a pathway for um, pressure to be relieved or gases to be relieved to um, an acceptable location, typically, you know, above the roof line where they can be vented. I see where that's very practical in some of the new construction you showed me in the in the previous two slides. But let's talk about this older warehouse. Say I want to buy it. Um, I've got a tenant. Um, there's still some residual PCE in the sub slab vapor. Uh, we've done our vapor extraction to the point where it's asymptotic, and then we want to put in this post applied coating and then a sub slab depressurization system. I've only done it for new buildings. How do you do it for an existing building? Is it wells in the center? Is it wells on the side? How, how do you de depressure an existing building? A great question. Uh, the answer is that each project is different. Okay, because what we need to do is we need to complete diagnostic testing to understand what the radius of influence will be in any given um, uh, building, mm -hmm. right? Because it, and it's dependent on what's underneath the slab, whether there's some sort of permeable aggregate layer or if there's clay or some other sort of dense soils that don't communicate well. And so we'll come out and essentially drill um, a pilot hole to pull a vacuum from at some uh, determined point in the slab where we believe we could put a an extraction point. And then we step out from that and we have uh, uh, drill in holes to actually um, sample the pressure drop mm -hmm. um, at different intervals. And so that gives us the radius of influence. And when you overlap all of those areas with your suction points, you're able to provide a full um, air barrier essentially underneath the slab. So let's talk about this uh, post applied photo. Would you actually come in, uh, you, you'd uh, put in the wells on the perimeter and then would you actually drill a sample port inside the building? Yeah, um, when we put in the suction points, we have to do a little bit of uh, slab removal. I see. Um, Right. So you have to do a little bit of slab removal. Maybe it's a 12 by 12 inch area. We remove the slab. You um, dig out the underlying soils. You backfill with gravel. Uh, you plumb in a riser pipe, which is then connected to a fan. I see. And then there's there's also a series of sub slab probes, pressure probes that we strategically place throughout the area to monitor the pressure drop to verify that the system is performing as designed. I see, so you're not necessarily putting in horizontal um, PVC here, for something like this is just strategically placed uh, vertical extraction points. Correct, yeah. For a new building, you might get fancy with horizontal, right? 
Or new no? buildings, we all we always get fancy with horizontal. Okay. Love, yeah, we love horizontal vent pipe for new buildings. And and the beauty of putting in, and, and what I can tell you is that a lot of times the systems that we design for new buildings are typically designed to be passive, right? They okay. they they operate passively, um, but they're designed to be upgradable to an active system in the future if deemed necessary. I see. And and that's where um, you know you install that infrastructure, and it could be super beneficial uh, further down the road if if they do elect to put in an active system. You're not having to tear up a slab and do all kinds of testing because that infrastructure is already in place. Very very interesting. So I'm going to stop sharing, and then let's just talk some more. All right. Yeah. So tell us some more about some of the. Uh, facilities that have been using your three types of vape, your, your VIMS uh, programs? Matt, you, you name it, and we've designed a mitigation system for it, honestly. I mean, right now, you know, what you have in the background there is is what we do a lot of. Okay. Is, uh, warehouse, warehouses, distribution facilities. Um, that's uh, primarily, I think, what we're doing, like on the East Coast in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, but a ton of that in California as well. Uh, but we also do we're doing police stations, fire stations, mm. hospitals, uh, multifamily, affordable housing. Um, honestly, almost every system or every type of structure we end up doing. We even do single family residential, you know, a lot of that. Well, I remember back in the 90s when they were redeveloping a lot of Huntington Beach's oil fields for uh, residential and yep. they, were, they were on the forefront of doing that and uh, Signal Hill as well. So it, it seems to have blossomed from just methane, you know, crude barriers to barriers that can withstand uh, the impacts of many other chemicals. Um, what about yep. for super sensitive facilities like um, schools, hospitals? Are, are you doing those too? Yeah, we are. Um, we just finished up a design for a hospital um, a few months ago. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we do uh, we do our fair share of school sites as well. Interesting, that's good to know. And so, um, where does your work and the cons environmental consultants' work start and end? So, by environmental consultant, I mean the folks that are typically mapping out the contaminants, putting in the the remediation system. When when do the partner engineerings of the world and fulcrums work start and yours come in? Yeah, typically, you know, there is some crossover in mm -hmm. the work that they do and that we do because we get into phase one, phase two site assessment work. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what you're talking about. Uh, but a lot of times we end up teaming up with okay. larger environmental consulting firms to just yeah. specialize in the design of, of the mitigation system. So once like a partner engineering um, or somebody like that does their assessment and they identify the vapor intrusion risk yes. that a system is needed, um, that's typically when we'll get involved. Good to know. Um, so let's talk about some agencies that are you're working with and sort of the agency approval process. Now, we all want to use our money wisely, but God forbid we put in a system and say the water board says, this isn't going to do the trick. So how do you get their approvals? Yeah, who that's do you, a who, great question. Okay. Yeah. It, um, we deal with DTSC, Water Board, um, some other state agencies, as well as counties and cities, right? So there's all kinds of different parties um, that are stakeholders in this process. Um, I would say DTSC and Water Board uh, is probably the most involved in the process because um, what it takes to get a design built um, and approved through these agencies is they want to know that they want to understand why you're designing the system, what the system is going to include, um, how you're going to verify that the system is working appropriately, and then how you're going to ensure that the system continues to operate as designed into the future. Mm -hmm. And so what, what they'll want to see um, is a design report, which outlines, you know, the system, um, the contaminants at the site, uh, description of what's being proposed, 
who the stakeholders are and the in the um, in the mitigation system, what their roles and responsibilities are, how you're going to inspect it, all of that stuff, right? And then they also want to see um, an operation maintenance and monitoring plan. You know, how are you going to maintain the system? You know, uh, what frequency are you going to sample? How are you going to sample? Um, and then a lot of times they want to see like a pre-occupancy sampling program that they can review and approve. And then what ends up happening is our VIMS design ends up being an exhibit to that report, right? So, we, yeah, and and uh, we'll coordinate with, you know, the larger environmental consulting firms that are producing these reports, or uh, we will partner up. Uh, we have a industry partner that we work with that will develop these reports um, in combination with us. I see. And um, what you mentioned something about the pre-occupancy testing. And did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. What kind of testing is that? So what ends up happening, and this isn't my area of expertise, but I can speak in general terms. Right. What we're typically doing is um, a lot of times the agencies want to see indoor air sampling. Okay. Right. To, right. To verify that the system is performing. Uh, but I think anybody in the industry who's had to do indoor air sampling understands the complexities and the complications with actually completing it, um, especially after a building is occupied, right? And you have all of these indoor... Um, and, and chemicals interfering. Exactly, yeah. Right? Like you so, could have something that just came back from the dry cleaners and it's PCA, PCE exhaust could have an impact on the indoor air testing. I see your point. Ex exactly. And so the um, the group that we partner up with, the program that they put together is essentially the pre-occupancy sampling is indoor air sampling prior to people moving in and, and all of these chemical interferences being in, inside the building. But they're also sampling from underneath the slab. And okay. most times... Most times we're designing in a network of subslab probes. And so what they're able to do is they're able to calculate the site-specific attenuation factor mm -hmm. for that building so mm -hmm. that once they've collected the indoor air and the subslab going forward, they can rely on subslab sampling only uh, to verify the effectiveness of the system. Well, you, you brought up that nasty uh, set of letters, the AF, the attenuation factor. There's been a lot of yeah. debates about what the attenu the screening attenuation factor should be. And we're not going to dive into a lot of detail, but the Cal EPA, the Water Board, the DTSC have said, well, if you're having uh, PCE, TCE vapors in the subsurface, you should assume at first pass that what you have in the indoor space is 3% of that, 0 0.03 of that. So if you get a number of 1,000, assume it's 30 micrograms per cubic meter in the indoor airspace. And you're allowed to present multiple lines of evidence, quote unquote, that that 0 0.03 can be relaxed a little. Um, so are your vapor barriers considered part of those multiple lines of evidence or does that have to be disregarded? Do you know? And these, negotiations? you know, I don't, yeah, I, I don't really get involved with that. I, what I understand though, for all intents and purposes, mm -hmm. what my guys are telling me is that the vapor barrier, as long as it's sealed properly, installed properly, is that it should, should not have any uh, vapors passing through it. Okay. Right. And, and the issue comes from, incomplete seals and cracks in the slab, something like that. Yeah, for a while there, and I don't know if this has changed and it's probably something to change, the agencies were saying, you have to remediate to this screening level, notwithstanding vapor barriers and our VIM system. So, and the, the agency main concern has been the following. What happens uh, if someone would have, say this warehouse behind me, someone were to drill and go through your vapor, your VIM system, what happens then? So how does your operations manual account for that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And honestly, more often than not, uh, mm -hmm. especially with these warehouses that we're designing, is that they're, it's like a, a shell that's being delivered to a tenant. And then mm -hmm. the tenant moves in and they first thing they want to do is tear open the slab, mm. you know? And so 
we've developed standard details, procedures, processes um, to not only open up the slab to limit uh, damage to the mitigation system, the underlying mitigation system, but also for repairing and replacing and restoring that system and ensuring that it that it performs. So, you know, so we mm -hmm. go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was I was, I was just going to say there are multiple steps involved to it, um, but there's also a lot of agencies have like a or some agencies have a covenant agreement um, that that they require the owner to enter into to essentially notify the agency prior to any um, work uh, where there's a potential for damaging the underlying membrane. Those have been around a while, but they've really been emphasized more and they're a lot more involved and a lot more detailed. And I look forward to the day where vapor barriers are approached just like you would an HVAC system. You know, an mm -hmm. HVAC system has various code provisions. Uh, the building code and the building inspector will review that. And there are certain operating and maintenance things you have to do for the HVAC system to work properly. So it sounds oh, yeah. like we're, we're getting there with VIM systems, um, at least in California. And then yeah. uh, with these covenants that are put on there that note that the VIMS is in place, I would think you would get, uh, you know, the operator, the tenant's attention. Uh, knowing that their operations could cease and desist if they don't address them correctly. Um, do you know if there's many times postings that a vapor, that a VIMS exists in the building and not to disrupt? Yeah, that's uh, a mandatory um, in oh, our it's... designs. Yeah, oh. in our designs, we specify there's a lot of codes that require it. Okay. And so it needs to be displayed in a prominent location. Right, where somebody who knows something is going to see it, okay. right? And and they used to actually stamp it into the slab. Ah, so you know, but we don't see that very often. It's usually some sort of placard um, that's mounted um, in a maintenance area, or office, or something like that. Very interesting. And um, I think for our first vapor barrier vim session this has been a lot of information and i know the uh listeners are appreciating it and uh we did a very cursory overview of technology regulations your uh techniques which are uh, state of the art where can people go to find out more about these systems and terra petra uh, you can find us on our website terra-petra.com Mm -hmm. um, it's got our toll-free number on there, so you can call from anywhere and uh, talk to a receptionist and just ask for me, and they'll patch, patch you through to me. Uh, if you want to email me, um, it's justin at terra-petra.com. And what is that uh, toll-free number, my friend? You know, I have it look. here. I have it here. <laughs> you it have is, it here? Okay. Yes, right. yes. It is 888-540-5703 zero three to find out more about uh vapor barriers and vims and uh justin thanks for taking part in what i believe is our 15th brownfield brain trust podcast i've learned a lot and uh you take care yeah bye, thanks everyone. matt good talking to you all right bye-bye bye everyone